Hello and welcome back to this tutorial. Two tutorials ago, I mentioned that there are two ways in which we can write web services. One way is to write the Java class first and generate the WSDL out of it. And the second way is to write the contract first, which is the WSDL first and then make the Java class after that. And in the previous tutorial, we took a look at the WSDL. We tried to understand all the different parts of the WSDL and uh, we learned what they mean and how they all work together. So does this mean that if we are doing the contract first development, that is the WSDL first development, we write the WSDL first manually? Uh, take a look at this WSDL here. I mean, we do understand a lot, lot of uh, these different tags and different sections now, but it's still an XML mess. It's an XML mess that we kind of understand a bit of, but it's still a mess. Imagine opening up a blank page in a text editor and typing all these values from beginning to end. I mean, this is really tedious. Ain't nobody got time for that. We need a shortcut. So the shortcut is to write the Java class first. Yes, you did hear that right. I'm saying we're gonna go with the visual first approach by writing the Java class first. How does that make sense? Well, the thing is, if we write the Java class first, we do get a nice XML in a nice format, right? Uh, Glassfish is gonna do all the work and it's gonna give us this XML. You're not gonna lock down on this XML yet. We're gonna write the class and generate the XML just so that we have a starting point. And then once we get the XML, we're gonna tweak all the different parts of it so that it is just to our liking and then we're gonna lock down the XML. So we are actually doing the WSDL first, but then just to get all this verbose XML generated for us, we write the class first, okay? I hope that makes sense. So we have kind of done that. We have written the class. We know what are the operations that we need and we have generated the WSDL, but this WSDL is not final yet. We want to make some changes to it. We wanna make, uh, we want to tweak all these defaults. And once we are happy with the the, the, the uh, final WSDL, we're going to lock that down. And then we're going to customize our Java class to match that WSDL. Most of the times, this is what we would end up doing in a real life scenario. Nobody's going to sit and type all these things from the scratch. We want a starting point. And the starting point is our Java class. Okay. So now that we have this class, and now that we have generated this visual, let's see how we can customize a lot of these things. A lot of the customizations arise from these annotations itself. Now the web service annotation is taking a lot of defaults. We haven't done anything to tell the web service annotation to say, hey, these are the names that we need. Now we're gonna do that. Uh, when you do a open parenthesis and control space on the web service, there are some parameters that you can enter over here. So let's take this parameter, which is the name. So you see here, the name has a Java doc here, which says it is the name of the web service used as the name of the WSDL colon port type. Okay, so if you look here, there is this port type, which is the product catalog that is getting picked up from this name. But let's say I configure it to say name equals and I'll call this testmart catalog. So basically I'm overriding the default. I don't want the service name to be product catalog. I want it to be testmart catalog. Now let me save and I'm gonna redeploy on Glassfish. So I'm gonna republish. Okay, it's done. Now let's see what happens if I refresh this now. You see here, the port type has changed. It is now called test smart catalog. So this makes sure that even if we change this class, this visual is not gonna change. At least this line of the visual is not gonna change. So no matter what you call the class, this line is gonna be the same, right? So that is basically the intention of all these annotations. You wanna make sure that these uh, visual names don't change if you change anything of this class. As long as you keep this annotation the same, it's gonna remain the same. So let's look at some of the other uh, properties of this whistle. So I do a control space again. 
you see here, it has something called as a port name. So I'm gonna call this test mart catalog port. And it also has what's called as a service name. Okay, I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna call this test mart catalog service. Okay, now let's see what happens when I publish with these two changes. Let me refresh the page and notice that we get a 404. Why do we get a 404? Because this URL is no longer valid. So notice that this URL is actually the name of the service. It says product catalog service. But now what we have done is in our code, we have gone ahead and changed the name. So this is our actual service name. Now let's change our URL. I'm gonna paste this new service name and access this Vistal. Now there you go. Our Vistal has changed home to a different URL. So this is, uh, you know, this is an important reason why you would wanna get the service name first so that you don't make changes to the URL. You don't wanna change the service name after people have started accessing your service. Now let's see, we have two more properties which I wanna use now. There is this property called target namespace. Now what does the target namespace mean? Let me go to a new line here. What does the target namespace mean? Now the namespace is kind of like a package in the Java world, right? So the namespace is used in an XML world has an equivalent of a package in the Java world. So when you say namespace, you're actually grouping all the XML types together, okay? So you notice that this whole visual is encapsulated by a definition stack. So all the information that we saw earlier, right? We saw types, messages, port, binding, and service. All these things are encapsulated inside what is called as a definition stack. Now the definition stack has a target namespace. Now this namespace ensures that all the types that are defined in this visual are not gonna be overridden by another uh, visual of the same type or another XML of the same type. So you wanna isolate all these types to a, a grouping, right, or to a package. So let's say you have this, right? You have a message name as get product categories. Now let's say you're working with a whole lot of XML and there is another message with the same name that would be problematic. So you want to group these things together into an equivalent of what we call as packages in the Java world. So you want this namespace to be unique. So this namespace is again auto-derived. Can you guess where this is getting this value from? Well, it's getting the value from this package, right? So since it's an equivalent of a package, we also have the namespace getting auto-derived from our package. So it's taken our package name and it's reversed the order, okay? So it's javabrains.kaushik.org. It's uh, our package is anyway uh, using a format uh, which is the convention, which is the reverse DNS. So it's kind of reversed it back. So it's taken the URL. So we wanna change this. So we can specify a target namespace. Now let's say I get the domain testmart.com. So I'm gonna call this HTTP colon slash slash testmart.com. Okay, so this is gonna be my target namespace. Now let me save and republish. And when I refresh this, you see that the target namespace has changed to testmart.com. And you see that everywhere, right? It's not just in the definitions. So in the types, there is a namespace mentioned as well. And that has also changed to testmart.com. We haven't examined details about the types yet. We're gonna do that later. But notice that these namespaces have all changed. So that's a good thing. We can control the namespaces just by this target namespace property of the web service. Then there is one more property here, which is actually there are two more. Uh, we're gonna talk about these two a bit later. So let's keep this aside for now. Let's look at the properties that the web method annotation provides. We've already seen the exclude property. We can actually exclude a web method from being published as a web service, as an operation of a web service, by using this exclude is equal to true property. 
So the action property allows us to give a name to the action. So let's say I'm calling this fetch categories. Okay, we're going to take a look at how it affects the visdil in a minute. So the other property that I want to change is the operation name. So the operation name is again something that takes the default as the method name. I can specify my own operation name here. So I'm going to say fetch categories and I'm going to republish this again. Now, if I refresh the page, you can see that a lot of things have changed here. So if you look at the operations, the operation name is now called fetch categories. And then the soap action is called fetch underscore categories. Even if you look here, the operation is fetch categories. Input action is fetch underscore categories. Don't worry too much about what these uh, actions and all that. I'm not going to go into that in detail now. But notice that these uh, these annotations and these properties have a direct effect on what these visual types are named, right? So let's say you want to call it retrieve. You can you can call it whatever you want, as long as this annotation is the same. So this is how you can customize the web methods. So we've looked at some of the basic attributes of the web service and the web method annotations. There are a few other annotations which let us configure the input and the output types, but we need to look at types in a bit more detail to kind of use that and customize that. So we're going to look at that in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching.